Today we're going to talk about worldview of Buddhism. Before we start, I just want to ask you how many of you have been to the last few series, last few nights that we're here. That's great. Excellent. Now, how many of you have friends or relatives or know people who are Baptists? Who are not Baptists, who are Buddhists. <laughs> who are Buddhists. That's great. Today we're going to tell you a little bit more about Buddhism. Not that I'm preaching Buddhism, but I want to let you know that our Christ, the salvation that God offers is so much better. But we also want to know that how we can communicate with our Buddhist friends. Today we're going to start this series with a game show first. All right, we're going to, this, the name of the game show is called, Who is This Religious Figure? Perhaps you can turn it on for me. That's great. Now, first question. Now, you have two choices, either Jesus or Buddha. So you have 50-50 chance, percent chance to, to get it right. So don't be too concerned. First question. This person's birth was accompanied by miraculous signs. Jesus or Buddha, right? His... He started his mission on, in his 30s. Jesus or Buddha? He called his disciples to follow and learn from him. Jesus or Buddha? He challenged the hypocrisy religious institutions of his day. Is it Jesus or is it Buddha? He moved from ritual worship to direct access to God. Is it Jesus? Or Buddha. This leader advocates peace and nonviolence. Is it Jesus or is it Buddha? He announced he was about to die in his last supper. Is it Jesus or Buddha? Now, how many of you say it's predominantly Jesus? Put up their hands. That's great. How many say it's predominantly Buddha? Put up their hand. And how many say it's both? Put up their hands. Whatever you have put up your hands, you're all right. <laughs> so everything is, everyone is right. Jesus and Buddha have very similar, a lot of similarities. Now this topic, we are oh, perhaps... Uh, now before I go on to the next slide, you may have a mental picture of what a Buddhist look like. Some of you will think he must be Asian, like Pastor Vincent. Or he may have to shave his head and put on a yellow gown. And you see them walk down the street in the bus stop. And they're Buddhists. But I'm going to tell you there are many, many famous Buddhists in, in this world. There are many celebrities Buddhists in this world. So let's turn on the next slide. How many of you can recognize some of these figures? The first one on this side, who is he? Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods. Famous one of the best golfers in the world. The second person? Zangerberg. Who, who, how many of you use Facebook? He is the founder of Facebook. The one in the middle? Here, Chinese. Yeah. Jackie Chan. Yes, yeah, right. <laughs> and in the middle? Here, the lady. And jo, and jo, Jolene, that's right. And the person on his this side? Steve Jobs. And the last person? Miranda Kerr. They are all Buddhists. Are you shocked? Why does the most famous, influential, beautiful, rich people in the world turn into Buddhism? Today we're going to look at some of the answers and what they offer and what's different to us. Next slide, please. Now, today we're going to talk about the ABC of Buddhism. Not only the beginning or the summer foundation of Buddhism, but also we're going to look at the three. The A stands for attitude. What should be our attitude towards Buddhism? B is what's the belief system. C is how can we communicate Christ to them? There's another famous person in this slide too, and it's me. <laughs> Now, where did I, you, you know the person, but where did I took this photo? 
Am I in a museum, a temple, or in a hotel lobby? None of the above. I took this photo in the foyer of my uh, father-in-law's house. I stayed there last month in his house. He, his family is a Buddhist, so devoted that he actually shipped a men-sized gold Buddha from Thailand into his house and put a place like about bigger than this stage to host a Buddha idol. So this is personal with this topic. I really want you to know, and we're in a journey of helping our families, our friends, how to escape from uh, the deceitfulness of this belief into believing in Christ. It's very important. We have some wins under our belt. We've been praying for our in-laws, and uh, so far they're not Buddhist yet. But we see one after another, some of our relatives have changed and they're transformed, become Christians in the process. And our families, um, Evelyn's family, have witnessed some of the bad witnesses, the hypocrisy of Christianity before. So for many years, they have put Christianity as the lowest of the list. But my mother-in-law actually pulled me aside and said, Vincent, if I'm not a Buddhist, I've become a Christian. So from the bottom of the list, we've moved to second. So would you pray for me and my wife? We've been on my knees every day to pray for our parents um, so that they can uh, receive Jesus because it's such a good deal. I remember Ken Blanchard. Have you heard of uh, Ken Blanchard? He is the person who wrote the One Minute Manager. He became a Christian. And he's asked people, ask him, why did you become a Christian, Ken? You're so smart and rich. He said, in business, I can find out there's no better deal than what Jesus has given us. Salvation for free. That's the difference. So let's go to number one, attitude. Next slide, please. Now, our attitude of Buddhism, there is two extreme views. The first view is just, just look into you know the Venn diagram here? We just look into the overlap, the similarities that we've talked about early on. We talk about we're all nonviolence, we all love one another, peace. And it's because Christianity is all about love, let's embrace one another. But I think that this is a naive way of talking about uh, Buddhism. The other extreme is to say we don't want to know anything about Buddhism, we just know what we believe and we're going to conquer them and stuff our religion into their throat. And both ways, I don't think it worked. I'm going to give you an example earlier on, later on. Now, a Christian philosopher, Os Guinness, he actually said, comparison is the mother of clarity. So we need to compare those religions together and look at the differences and similarities, and we can preach the gospel with wisdom. Next slide, please. So what is the attitude? Luckily for us, we have the Bible. How many of you read the Bible daily? Now, don't put up your hand. <laughs> the Bible actually gives us all the answers in the world. And even it gives us a master class on how to preach the gospel to people who don't believe in Christ. We've just read earlier on from Pastor Cal. It talks about Paul, who is a Christian evangelist, a missionary. He was in Athens by himself. The Bible tells us his spirit is provoked. Now, one of the problems of Christians is when we go to Bali, when we go to Thailand, our spirit is not provoked at all. We just enjoy the massage, the food. Now, there's nothing wrong with doing that. But when we see people worshipping false gods, pagan worship, animal sacrifices, and the life of no hope, our hearts should be provoked. When we see our parents worshipping um, fame and money, that should provoke our heart. Paul had the same feeling when he was in this uh, Athens because in, at that time, Greek worshipped different idols. But instead of being angry, frustrated, he prayed and he actually started looking and walking around and find out some of the similarities we can make points of connection. He walked around and find a temple 
and to his surprise, it said, temple to the unknown gods. And Paul immediately know that this is my point of connection. I'm going to use this to preach. Brothers and sisters, do you know that when I was in Bible college, the first lesson in missions is that sometimes we think that God is only in Australia. This is not the case. God is everywhere, even to the remotest part of the world. He is already working, and when we go there, we need to find out what God is already doing and incorporate with Him. So what Paul has done is find out in their belief system what are the footprints, the trademarks that God has put inside the culture and work together with it. So we need to know more about what other people believe. So the first thing, poor spirit was provoked, but he actually pined points of connection. Even so, he actually read some of the poets and quote them. How many of you can quote some of the teachings of other religion? How many of you can quote what uh, some of the richest people have said, the philosophies that they believe? A lot of us don't. We need to know what they believe so that we can preach the gospel to them. But Paul didn't stop there. He was bold, as Pastor Cow said. He was not fed with being rejected. He preached Jesus boldly, but respectfully. Paul, in his letters in Corinthians, he said, I want to win people. So for a Jew, I became a Jew. For the Gentiles, I became a Gentile. For me, Vincent, for an Asian, I'll be an Asian. For Australian, I'll be Australian. To be an Anglo-Saxon, I become an Anglo-Saxon. To be a black person, I become, hey brother, a black person so that I can preach the gospel to them. Do you know the hearts of Jesus that he came down from heaven in the shape and manner of a man so that he can preach the gospel to us? Same as Paul, and you should be same as us. So the first is our attitude. Our attitude has to be right. For you to be effective, you have to humble yourself so that you'll be a totally effective tool for God. Attitude. So let's look at B, the belief of Buddhists, so we can preach the good news to them. So let's, next slide. Now belief, first of all, we need to know some of the background of Buddhism. Buddhism is the fourth largest religion in the world. It originates from India, now the Nepal uh, area. And it's mainly in Asia. Now, I want you to know that Asians and Westerners think very differently. It's uh, philosophy 101. The Eastern religion of philosophy is mainly looking at relationship. The development of the uh, religion in Asia is because we live in a very flat plain. So the problem that we face is how we deal with one another. Whereas in the Western world, the bedrock of philosophy comes from Greek, where they actually uh, are born and face the ocean in a peninsula. So the main thing is, how can I conquer nature? Is there a God? I need to make sure I know logic and mathematics so I can trade. So the bedrock of those two philosophies are totally different. So we need to know. Now, one of the great examples is I was in Taiwan, and we have an um, a Uber kind of car, so I, I, I practice my Mandarin with him. And he, we talk about politics and different things in the car. And he said, Do you, and I said, that, uh, how come you don't reinforce a lot of laws? He's, and he said, in Taiwan, um, it comes in this order. Relationship, um, moral, and then rules. And for Westerners, you come the law first, moral, and you come relationship. So it's the other way around. So for example, if... Uh, you have a car accident, they would actually try to, uh, they don't go to the law first, they don't report it, they try to deal with themselves, and they talk about different things, if I need, you give me more, if I don't need you, you give me more. And then the law is 
go to the end. So it's very, very different. So we need to understand it. Now, that's why in uh, Buddhism philosophy, it's actually how to deal with suffering. That's the main goal, not to know about God. In fact, um, I'll tell you a story how it first started. It was this a prince. He was shielded by his father until adulthood about suffering in India. How many of you have been to India before? There are lots of suffering in India. So he wanted to shield his son from seeing suffering. But when he became an adult, he actually ventured outside. And he saw all the suffering, all the sickness, all the poverty that is in India, and he was deeply hurt. He was a noble man. And he said to himself, if I could not find a solution to solve the suffering of the world, I'm going to sit down in this uh, peckermore tree and will not get up and eat. So he's a very noble man. After 10 days and almost starved to death, he finds a solution. And that's become the basic core belief of Buddhism. So that's how it uh, started. And the beginning of Buddhism is mainly a philosophy. In fact, he was called the atheist uh, of his day by the hin Hindus. He was prosecuted because he thinks he has a philosophy that doesn't need God at all. But later on, it moved to a religion. Now, the next thing is, we see in Australia, not a lot of Buddhists, but in some countries, it's the state religion. How many of you have been to Thailand before? One of the things, if you join a tour, is you visit temples, isn't it? So the whole nation uh, are, are Buddhists. Same as Mongolia and Nepal. All these nations are state religion. Um, uh, the state religion is Buddhism. Now, I've, it's actually in the line of decline for many years for Buddhism because it's so hard to achieve. But recently, there's a resurgence. And you can see all the celebrity Buddhists that actually become uh, celebrities that become Buddhists. I think one of the main reasons is because the rich, the powerful, are fed up with the Western world. How we worship wealth, and the church did not give them the right solution. When we preach the gospel, we don't talk the language. So they find a way, and the most deceptive way of Buddhism is that they can find a solution without God. So it's very attractive to them because many of the celebrities we've seen, they're hurt by Christianity. So there is a, a religion that actually can solve the problem of the world, very insightful, and they actually look at the way that Asians live. They, li they live with artistically, they have a lot of etiquette, they do honor and respect the parents and people, and they very, live very peacefully. And I think this attracts to a lot of people. We do have all these uh, qualities as Christianity, and we need to bring it out from the gospel and preach it to them as well. So let's look at the core belief. Next slide, please. Now, when we talk about belief, a lot of times, or, or preaching the gospel, we um, sometimes quote this verse in 2 Timothy 4.2. We say that preach the word, we prepare in season and out of season to correct, rebuke, and to encourage. We did really well in the first part when we have our training, but the sec we, we, do not, we don't want you to neglect the second part with great patience and careful instruction. That's two parts to this instruction. We need to know our stuff in Christianity, but we need to use our wisdom that God has given us to preach the gospel with patience and with careful instruction. And that's what we should do in our belief system. We need to look at the similarities and the differences. Next slide, please. Now, Buddhism is so big. In fact, Buddha himself talked a lot. He actually, the volume of the Buddhist scripture is 10 times of the Bible. And there are many, many readings added on to that. So I'm not going to talk about all of them. The core belief is the three universal truths, the four noble truths, and the eight, path, the eight pathway um, um, for the training in karma. I'm not going to touch on all of them. I'm going to just touch on the four noble truths of Buddhism. So it's almost like the spiritual law of, uh, of Buddhists. So the first law that they have is life is suffering. And we can see it in the world, can't we? 
We can see the world. We can see all the suffering of this world when we just walk out and see. Even in our lives, we do suffer a lot. And the way to explain why there is suffering is that because everything is changing. There are things that you want, but you don't get it. But the things you already got, they change. I know that this year, there are many young married couples. How many uh, young married couples or uh, just planning to get married? According to Buddhists, if you are a husband and expect your wife in 20 years to look the same, you're into suffering. <laughs> but for women, you expect your husband to look the same, you start to suffer in 10 years. <laughs> So that's the philo basic philosophy of, uh, of Buddhism. The things you get, you don't get. For example, I don't have a boyfriend or girlfriend. I suffer. But if you have one, you want to get out of it. <laughs> so Buddhism is whatever you get or you don't get, life is suffering. Now, this is the same of the teaching of the wisest person uh, in the world. Jesus said that. And the second person who is the smartest in the world ever live is uh, Solomon. In his book of Ecclesiastes, he said, life is meaningless. It's all suffering. He have tried everything. He have tried wealth, raising family. He have big projects. And at the end of the day, he says, everything is meaningless. It's all suffering under the sun. But what he's saying is, over the sun, when we have God in our life, life may not be suffering. So this is a very good point for us of connection with uh, the Buddhists. Life is suffering, but with Christ, life can be joyful. We can preach that to them. The second um, uh, point of the noble truth of Buddhism is the origin of suffering is because we have desires. We want it. So the way that Buddhists want to get rid of suffering is to get rid of all desires. And the way to explain it is, we don't need to get onto things too tightly because everything happens because of different conditions that if it's met, something will appear in front of you. For example, the day I stand here today, if Pastor Timon didn't know some of the people in OCF and uh, ACC, he would not have asked me to meet with him um, fortnightly, and we won't have conversation. He won't ask me to apply for this position, and uh, I may not be here today. I may be preaching in another church. Now, if you go back a little bit further, you'll say that if, uh, some of you may know, I'm actually from Hong Kong. If China is not taking over Hong Kong in 1997, my family will not send me to study here today. So because of the conflict 100 years ago, because of that, all the conditions are here before you today. And if you even go even further, if my parents never met and they never fall in love and got married, I won't be here today. So don't hold on too tightly to a person because that person appeared in front of you is because of many conditions. Many movies actually use this philosophy and make a movie. In a classical movie, Back to Future. How many of you watched that movie? Back to Future. Michael J. Fox, he, his name is called Marty. Marty McFlies. How many remember that in the car? He was living in his 80s, but accidentally, because he wanted to escape from being killed, he jumped into uh, a car, into a, a time machine, and brought back in time in 19, 1955. And in Inevitably, he actually disrupted the first meeting of their parents. And to his surprise, his own mother fell in love with him. So he had to make every effort to make sure the two parents can meet together. But with a lot of things happening, it's not going to happen. So he had to fight Biff. He had to, 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 to kill, uh, to, 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 to do a lot of things. And at the end, he had to um, perform a good... Uh, uh, can you go back a little bit first? Not, not this slide, the one before. 
He had to perform in the prom night. You know, Americans have prom night. In Enchanted Under the Sea, he had to play. And while he's playing, um, he saw his parents uh, dancing together. And he vividly remembered his parents said once that this is the deal that sealed the marriage. It said they kissed for the first time in that particular song. But one of the guitarists who is supposed to play, he hurt his hand, so he can't play. And Michael J. Swart was begging, please play this, otherwise they won't uh, dance, they won't kiss, and they won't get married. And people were, were amused. And, and that band said, nobody can play unless you know how to play. He said, okay, I'll play. So he was playing in the band in, in this. And while he's playing, his parents was start to dance, but an intruder came in, pushed his dad away, the next slide, please. His, his dad's name is called George, and mother's name is Lorraine. And while they're dancing, the intruder pushed him, so when he looked at his hands, he actually started to disappear. He can't see his own hand. He looked at the picture of his brothers. His brothers and sisters disappear. Half of his body is gone, so he was lying down, can't play uh, the guitar. And Lorraine was shouting out, George, George, help me. And George, at this instance, get his courage, push his intruder away, took the girl, give her a kiss, and, uh, and that, this is back to history. So, and Michael J. Fox, all of a sudden from lying down, he stood up, started to play his guitar. Now, what it's illustrated is, if the parents have never met, he would never appear uh, in his life. So in life, many things like this happen. If, for example, people came from overseas, certain things trigger you to come to Australia. If that doesn't happen, you won't be here today. Now, the Bible also tells us that um, desire or we hold on to something very tight. The Bible calls this idols. Idols is not confined to worship a physical figure, but if we hold on to something like money or pride, it becomes our desire. And the Bible tells us anything that robs us from worshiping God, this becomes an idol. And instead of say all the things are bad, like Buddhism, we can say that God gives everything to us. Many of them are good. And there's one of the criticism how Confucianism attacked Buddhism because Confucianism is very much into the love of the family, respect. But Buddhism, if you want to be a good Buddhist, you have to get rid of love itself. So let's look at the next slide. So first two we'll talk about. The third one is true freedom is extinguish our desire. And when we do that, we become an enlightened state and we'll reach the sea of nirvana, like our heaven. Now, for us, this is the main difference between Christianity and Buddhism. When we extinguish the desire, we actually surrender our life to God. And the next one is desire can be um, changed or we can be enlightened, extinguished by following the Noble Eight Pathway. Like all religion, they have to do things to reach salvation. For Christians, it's totally different. God has done everything for us and our life should be a life of celebration and joy. So it's a very, very different now, let, let's look at the next slide. Now, let's compare uh, Christianity and also Buddhism further. Now, a lot of people think that all religion on the surface looks different, but the core is the same. But no, no, no. Most religion on the surface looks the same, the way that we meet together, sing songs, but... In the core of it is very, very different. The first thing is, in Buddhism, they said there's no God in their system of belief. Whereas Jesus said you need to know God. You need to know God, our Creator. Now, from that point onwards, it seems to be uh, the, the like domino effect, it tumbles on the opposite direction. Buddhists believe that you need to follow the rules and my teaching. But Jesus said, you follow me because I'm going to take you there. I'm going to ask you which way is better. If I want you to be here and go to Gola today, I give you a few rules how to live. If you see a light, turn left or turn right. 
or I sit next to you and I direct you every corner of the way to go to Gola. Which way is better? Of course, our way is a lot better because we have a personal saviour that's with us. For them, they have no reassurance. They just follow the rules with not knowing which way to go or how many thousands of generations they have to regenerate in order to reach their sea of savannah. The second is they talk about reincarnation. Now for them, um, if you do good work you, or bad, you will be rewarded or be punished by what you become in the next generation. It's called re uh, re reincarnation. There's six choices. If you are good, you can become uh, closer to God, a demigod, which can help back to help people, or become a better person, perhaps a, a, a high monk. If you do bad, you can become a poorer person or a um, person who don't have much or disability or um, problems in your life. And the next step is you can become an animal. And that's one of the reasons you don't eat animals because you may be eating your ancestor. <laughs> when it's, uh, you, you bought a chicken home and it can be your, your, your grandmother that has become a chicken because they've done bad things. So they don't eat uh, uh, true Buddhists, don't eat uh, meat. That's, that's the main reason. And the last choice, if you've done really, really bad, you go to hell and you have no ch chance of regeneration. So they have no, and there's no, there's no rules. And there's, they don't know how many generations. So they're in a total cycle of, of regeneration all the time. So it is, to me, a real suffering. Um, but Jesus said, follow me. And he said, you're going to have a new birth. You're going to be born again and you have the the promise of salvation. It's totally different. Now, Buddha believed in meditation. Now, their meditation is very different from ours. The meditation is actually to empty the mind. I'm going to do an experiment. I want you to empty your, close your eyes and empty yourself and think of nothing for 10 seconds. All right, you can open your eyes now. It's very, very hard. Some of you may say, what is Vincent up to? Or he can hear the sound of the baby's cry. For people to block everything out and empty their mind is totally different. For Christians, meditation means we meditate on the Word of God and God Himself. It's a lot easier and easier to achieve. And last thing is, as I've mentioned, they mention about karma. Karma actually means the cause and effects. If you do... Good things, you have good results. But for them, there's no, you're never good enough. So you have to do, 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 do. In our uh, belief in Christ, Christ already done everything that we have. So it, it, like Ken Blanchard said, it's just a deal that uh, is so good, he can't receive this deal. If we receive Jesus, we got everything that uh, God has prom promised we've inherited. If you're Buddha, there's no reassurance. So a lot of Buddha become very religious and folk religion actually uh, creeps in because they know that you have to rely on something supernatural. So I have a picture of Buddha there. On one side, on this side, is a fat Chinese Buddha. And on the right, uh, on this side, there's a skinny Indian Buddha because they don't hold on to truth and it's so subject to corruption and people's interpretation. So from an uh, Indian Finn Buddha, once they reach China, they can change shape. Even some of the gods change sex. And uh, Guan Yin, for example, uh, which is one of the most worshipped uh, god in Asia, was a man before he, he went to uh, China. And all of a sudden, she became a woman. Um, so they're all subject to change and corrupted and degenerated into folk. Uh, religion. So we need to be aware of all this. So which belief system is better? I believe, our belief is so much superior. Let's look at C then. How can we communicate this good news to our Buddhist friends? So next slide, please. Now first of all, like what Paul has said, we need to think of building bridges, not walls. A lot of Christians want to show off their theology and use a lot of what we so-call Christian needs. They don't understand it. We need to make sure we understand their language of karma 
enlightenment. We need to use their language. We need to build walls. A great example is Hudson Taylor. How many of you have heard of Hudson Taylor before? He's a missionary in China. He was being laughed at and ridiculed because he said, that in order to preach gospel to Chinese, I need to dress like one. So he have his piggy tail, he shaved his head in front, dressed like Chinese. People laugh at him. They're not laughing now because OMF is still operating uh, over almost 100 years. And where's all the mission society actually closed in China at that time? His way of evangelism is the most effective way. So we need to think of building bridges. The second is we need to share our testimony. Most people who are into baptism are Asians, and they're very practical. If you give them a theory, they will say yes, politely, but will not believe. They want to see your good testimony. You need to actually prepare it and write it out yourself. In my training with the navigators, for example, we need to write a 30-minute a five-minute and a one-minute testimony. If people ask you, why do you believe you have a reason, uh, in season, out of season, to give a reason why you believe. So we need to give our testimony, and we need to look at our life to give great testimony as well. The third thing, we need to know the uniqueness of our belief, as we've mentioned earlier. Christ is the only way to God, and we are certain of that, because it's not based on philosophy, it's based on on history. It can be tested. It's science, forensic science. Um, we can prove it, whereas Buddhism has changed so many times. And the fourth thing we need to know is we need to pray. Brothers and sisters, the enemies have used this religion to actually born and to um, hold on to people for generations. There are evil spirits incorporated. If you go to some of those places, you can feel the eeriness of that because they have um, Vigi board, they have all these things incorporated with that. We need to pray. We're in a battle of spiritual warfare. We need to pray for our brothers and sisters, our family. So let's look at the next slide. Today we talk about what it should be our attitude when we preach the gospel to Buddhists. We talk about what's their core belief as well and how to communicate with them. Uh, on Friday, I was have lunch in uh, the lunchroom and uh, accidentally, I pick up this magazine called the Eternity uh, Magazine. How many of you have, have read this newspaper before? It's a Christian magazine which put out. And to my surprise, and God's timing is right. And uh, in the middle of it, you have a big picture and a big title of teaching Buddhists to be Buddhists to preach Christ. And I, it's actually, I was really intrigued, so I read this. It was about this man, his name is Peter. He was a Buddhist monk before. And he was so angry with Christians, and it's time he, he wants to kill the pastor in the church. And after talking with him, he said, Christianity is not that bad. So after a few months talking with him, he actually became a Christian. And when he became a Christian, he studied his PhD in a Bible college in uh, missiology. So he's, he knows his stuff. And he studied how the Westerners preach the gospel and why pe the monks are so angry with them. Because when Christians want to say, you are a sinner and you can have eternal life in Jesus Christ, it makes no sense to a Buddhist because for Buddhists, there's no concept of sin. If you do something wrong, you go to the next life and it's your karma. There's no concept of sin in life. And to tell them that you have eternal life because life is suffering, eternal life that you're going to bring me to eternal suffering, no way. I don't want to, to have it. So what he tried with different ways of reaching to the Buddhists, he said, if you want to a Buddhist, do good work, Great. And, and one of the things is, a lot of Christians tell them not to do good work. You need to rely on Jesus. But he, Peter's stand is different. He said, do all the good works that you can, but remember, all the good works you have, you're still in this cycle of karma and regeneration. You will never get out of it unless someone outside of this system helps you. And his name is Jesus Christ. 
and to show them the gospel and reach out with this method. And it's been very, very successful. So successful that he resigned from being a professor and set up a, uh, a company organization to reach the Buddhists in his country. Very, very effective. So, brothers and sisters, we need to know Christ. We need to know what people believe, and we need to humble ourselves. To finish with the next slide, please, I'm going to ask you to reflect on two questions. Do I take my faith seriously enough? People who are Buddhists, they shave their head, forsake their family, go to a monastery, and this is the way they show how serious they are about the faith. How about us? Have we taken God's grace for granted? People have to work so hard to have salvation. We take it for free. Have we taken it for granted? Have we thanked God enough? And lastly, I want to ask these questions. How can I equip myself to preach the gospel better to the people around us? Let us pray. I'll ask the worship team to come forward. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you because you've given us opportunities to share the good news to the world. And in Australia, we're one of the most multicultural countries of the world. You've brought people from different parts of the world to come to us. Father, help us to be a multicultural church, to reach out to our brothers and sisters, friends, families, so that they can know you. Help us to know you more and to know um, them more so they can preach the gospel with patience and careful instruction. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.